<sighs> okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening, or good afternoon, or morning, depending on when you're listening. Welcome to the 67th episode of hopefully many episodes of Bard Advice, a D&D slash TTRPG slash nerd centric podcast where I, Charles Chaz Yazik, the DM, the Bard, however you may know me, do my best to answer any questions that you might have or submit to the show. Before we get started, as we like to do at the top of every show, remind everyone of the email, which is bardadvice at gmail.com. It also looks like bardadvice, if that's easier to remember. If you have any questions, concerns, complaints, queries, criticisms, critiques, etc., please send them over there, bardadvice at gmail.com. I appreciate all of the ones that send questions in. You're the ones helping keeping the show rolling. As for merch, if you want to get some of that, you can go over to manshorts.com or, more notably, the... Um, Crackandice.com, and I don't know if I have one of those images. Oh, I do. Crackandice.com to get the new dice. The new set just came out, which we'll talk about a little later, but that's just a reminder to go pick up those. And if you'd like to contribute to anything that I'm doing musically, you can do so directly via PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo, all of which are Yazik, Y-A-H-Z-I-C-K. I hope that everybody's doing well this evening for Friday. I hope everybody had a good Friday. For some, it's the beginning of the weekend for the rest of us we just work every day <laughs> so i hope everybody's doing well out there we've got some questions to go through this evening before we get into a art corner situation i did want to briefly speak about our sponsor this week i'm not going to go into too too much detail but i did just want to mention it and then we'll also be speaking about it in a little more detail in the ad this weekend but for anybody who isn't aware of it, there is a floating TTRPG setting that's made by a father-son team called Homie and the Dude. It's on Kickstarter right now. It's called The Wandering Tavern. It looks pretty awesome, and I've actually got a little bit of copy that I can read about it. So The Wandering Tavern is a 150-plus page floating TTRPG setting inspired by Studio Ghibli. The system, it's an agnostic system, so... It, but it does include optional 5e stats, and it's packed full of expansive battle maps, plot hooks, new PCs, plug-and-play zephyrs, ghostly spirits. I mean, it's a floating city, so how cool is that? And all backers at all tiers, from what I understand, get a free 3D printable mini of the city itself. So it's a pretty cool thing. So I would definitely recommend going to check it out if you're into that sort of thing, <laughs> as I imagine a lot of people that listen or watch this show are. Uh, the Wandering Tavern, available now on Kickstarter. For Art Corner this week, I just wanted to briefly feature a show that I've just recently discovered and have been watching on HBO Max. I think it's actually a CBC show, so it's Canadian, but it's called Sort Of, and it's really good. It's really, really well written, and I've been enjoying it a lot. Plus, the episodes are like 20 minutes, so they're easily digestible. Um, so it's about this character named Sabi, who is a 30-something gender-fluid person who is just kind of dealing with life. They're a nanny as well as a bartender and friend to lots of eccentric people. And they're from a, you know, relatively conservative Pakistani family. So there's elements of that in there as well. But just overall, the writing is really well done. In fact, I think it's won some awards for the writing specifically. So if anybody might, is looking for something new to watch, like I said, the episodes are like 20 minutes, so you can ch kind of churn through them. They're on season three at the moment, and I only, like I said, I only recently found it. My wife's actually known about it and has watched it, but um, she told me about it the other night, and I think I'm like halfway through the second season by now. So it's really, really good. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. That's what we have for Art Corner. Oh, also, I missed this. Thank you, chat, and for the people in there. There is a link for the Discord in the chat. So if you have not joined there, I would recommend checking that out because lots of funny, cool stuff goes in there. Does art include novels? Well, certainly. I want to get the Sarah Dice, but the new set, and I get the Glow in the Dark set. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. I'll actually just show you briefly before we get really into the questions, the dice. I'll bring them back up in a moment. But So this is the Redux, or the Redo, however I guess you would pronounce it. So it's essentially a rerun of the initial set, but it's a little cooler, I think. I think the design's a little nicer. They're a little more smooth there. So it's still the yellow and the, the, the original, like yellow and purple. It's got like the custom bag in the box and 
me and Riggs on the cards, me and Waylon. And yeah, they're available as of last night. So I don't know, you know, like I said, these, the runs that we're doing on these things is limited. There's not too many dice sets available. So I would recommend if you're interested in them, go in and get in them now. And actually our first question deals with that. So I guess we might as well get into that as well and just start doing the questions. So let's do that. The first question of the evening. Oh, you know what? And I would be remiss if I didn't do my other housekeeping things at the top of the show, which is to thank all of our members, our patrons, our super chatters, and remind everybody to please like, comment, subscribe. Liking the thing really helps. And uh, commenting and uh, subscribing as well. And then turn on notifications and rate the podcast on your respective platforms. So, whew. Okay, so I think that's everything. So that's all of the housekeeping stuff. Let's get into the questions. So the first question is from Stacy. <laughs> and by the way, Stacy also signed this, not Chris, which I thought was really funny, just because I'm so used to seeing Chris as a signature on the, I don't know why I said signature that way, uh, somebody uh, as, the, as the signature for a question. I'm used to seeing Chris so much, so it was kind of funny to see not Chris. Anyway, Stacy asks, Hi, Bard. I have the Man Short set, but not the Sarah set yet. Why are the released dice sets not yet in the store? And would the store have information about the sets when known? I am mostly pleased with the first set, though its glow-in-the-dark aspect is weak on mine. I can't afford to collect all four, so knowing what the other sets will be would be helpful. Thank you. Yes, understandably so. And uh, first of all, thank you for the question, and I hope that... You know, I hope that that the that the issue with the dice is something that you can deal with. If it's not, and it's a real problem, and you feel like it's not the quality that you deserve, then I would reach out to Kraken directly. They're really good people there, so I'm sure that they would work with you on either replacing them or figure something, figuring something out. Maybe they could offer a discount on another set or something. But I would definitely reach out to them if it is as much of a bother. If not, you know, sorry that it's not as great as it could have been. But I ha I will say I have seen from other people that they've been really pleased with them. The dice set, the redo set is now available. That's the kind of the OG one. As I said, there aren't limited numbers, but I do have some at my house of my own. So, you know, if it comes down to it, then maybe I'll just send you another set. But at the moment, I would recommend reaching out to them directly. And then this is the new redo set. I don't unfortunately have any images of the Florida Man set, which will look like this. And I'm not sure how well you can see. The focus isn't great on this, neither is the lighting. But it is a, it's like a baby blue uh, dye and then with like pink lettering, or rather numbering, I guess. But I think that, I think it looks really cool. And I will have, what I'll do is I'll reach out to Kraken and I'll get some images for those that I can share on next week's episode. So see what's going on ordered five yesterday ordered at five yesterday am i not ready shit wow thanks chris much appreciated you have a question for chat chat okay heard kraken are amazing i had an issue with delivery delivery person spilled something oh wow they were quick to reply and assist so i'm glad to hear it what's up with the book oh yeah that's a thing that <laughs> it's kind of creeping along we'll see Oh, hey, what's going on, Justin? Oh, you know what? I responded to your texts, all oh, your texts in my head. Sorry about that. I'll respond to them for real after this. Show it on the Discord only. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, maybe that is what I'll do. I'll share it on the Discord. Technically, I kind of already did share it on the Discord. So, Stacy, not Chris, are you on the Discord? Get in there. But either way, I'll uh, I'll see about what's going on with those like the first chapter. Well, thank you. Yeah, so that's a we can talk about that more in chat chat. Like I've started rewriting a book. It's like a fantasy book that I started writing when I was like in my early 20s and I ended up getting like, you know, 150 pages or so into it, but now I'm kind of rewriting it. And so I've got the first chapter that I've been sending out to people. He's not Justin. He's he's Justin, not Justin. Not to be confused with Jay, who's also just Justin. That's true. Do people know that? Jay Jay Hagley's first name is Justin. <laughs> 
So I don't know if that's the only, I, I think that he was going by Jay anyway, but then when he became like part of the friend group, it was like, well, we can't do with two Justins. Oh, you got your Sarah set. Awesome. Yes. Jay is also a Justin. And Jay's in general, by the way, seem to surround my life. My wife's name is Jessica. And my business partner is Justin. And this is Justin. There's a lot of them. And Jay's Justin. And Waylon Rigsby, <laughs> Kyle Rigsby, who plays Waylon, his older brother is Justin. So, yeah. I don't know what it is with me and the J's. J's and C's, I guess. Yeah. C's too. Chris's. Charles. And your nickname is J? Well, there you go. That makes sense. That, 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 that explains your proximity to me. All right. So I think that there was an answer in there for the dice stuff. Yeah. Sorry it hasn't been ideal. But like I said, if there's any major issues, just reach out. We'll figure it out. All right. So. Thank you for the question, Stacy. The next question is from Esty or S S T. I guess it's Esty. So Esty asks, "Hi DM, love the podcast. First time questioner. I thought I'd give you a would you rather since my party and I were recently discussing it. As a PC, would you rather explore a vast open world with endless possibilities but little guidance?" Or follow a linear story with predetermined plot, but plenty of twists, turns, and surprises. Thanks for making the show. Have a great day. Thank you very much for the question, and I'm glad that you sent one in. First-time questions are great. That makes me happy, because... And I know that there's some of you out there with questions that have not sent them in. Send them in. Be like Esty. Send in the question. Uh, all right, so let's talk about it. Vast open world with little guidance? That sounds that sounds like me. Whatever gets you closer to One Piece. We don't even know what the One Piece is yet, Justin. So, um, <laughs> a vast open world with endless possibilities and little guidance or a linear story. Let's see. Well, chat's saying, depends on the campaign and also the DM, which is kind of true, but also a little bit of, you know, I don't want to cop out of the answer too quickly. Let's see. I my my instinct says the first one just because and, and now I'd say actually it probably matters more about the group than the DM or the or the plot just because of like what your experience is cuz like if it was just me and you know like Justin and Rigsby and these guys I've been playing D&D with for a decade plus the vast open world would be I think preferable just because we could have our own fun with it. We're all experienced enough as players and experienced enough together where we could figure it out and not need too much handholding. But yeah, I mean, depending on the story, it can be a linear one can be good if it's written well. Now, I think that the real goal in any of these TTRPGs is to kind of come up with a balance between those two things. You want to let the players feel like the, the world is large enough that they have agency to decide where to go and what to do, but then also have a have a through line that's going on like a bit of a like a bit of a soft railroad. See what chat says. Depends on the party. I like normally. I like to. Uh, I like open world, but some people need a leash. Well, yeah. I like to wander. A player's wandering makes me want to start drinking again. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Well, it is stressful just because it's like that was my. You know, Studebaker Peppercorn was a wanderer. Open sandbox. I need a goal though. There are always loads of side quests. Yeah, I mean, I guess that I would need some sort of a motivation beyond just, like, you're this character in this world. Because at that point, it's kind of like, what are we doing? But I think that the if, if I were in charge, as far as deciding what the campaign would be and how it would, how it would run, I think that I would want there to be a particular goal or objective that could be reached a myriad of, of different ways. And that's, you know, I think something like Baldur's Gate 3, right? Like, there's the main goal that you have with the Elder Brain, but then there's also 
all these stories, all these side stories going on. And then there are so many different ways that you can get there, right? That's one of the things that's praised about the game is that there's like all these different endings. I think that that should be, if possible, the same for your D&D game. You should try and try and keep it where you allow the players to make their own decisions about what's going on and how they accomplish the thing. But yeah, I mean, you're going to need at least like something to do. There's going to have to be some sort of catalyst or conflict that that gets you started because then otherwise it's just like, then you're just kind of like sitting around role playing with characters, Vote wide open story so the players can ignore the main story and get their side quest done. That's true. I will say like with stuff like Assassin's Creed, I think they do a really great job of mixing that in because if you want to, you can just brute force run through the story. But what I like to do is just kind of explore the world. And I'm also like a big viewpoints guy. Like whenever I get into an area, I go and find all the viewpoints and get those knocked out just so it helps open the map quicker. I think it's preferred to have a linear plot for the communal storytelling. Having an open world is fun until the party can't decide which plot point to go to. Yeah. Imagine having a session zero while the party is at the bar. Yeah, and I think that that's actually like why, because a bar, because there's so many ways, places you could go from a bar. If it's like a bar in like a harbor city, then then you just, you know, you can go off on a boat to anywhere. Or even if it's like the bar in the middle of a major city, the types of characters that are in there can serve as the catalyst for stories and, and plot developing in the first place. So there's a fine line between and open world and chasing butterflies. Unless they're fire-breathing carnivorous butterflies. That's true. Or if they're like mutant... <laughs> if they're like mutant cicada swarm, which is... may or may not be an enemy that I have planned for doing like a Florida Man supplement. Usually create a world that then gets narrowed into specific points that the party follows. They need a goal. So there are always loads of side quests. Yeah, the side quest thing is the side quests are great for like downtime and like when you know people are entering new areas and I t I, f I find myself spending a lot of time doing those kind of things on Assassin's Creed where sometimes I'll just be like, all right, well I'm gonna play for like you know an hour and then all I'm gonna do is like side quest side quest stuff. Isn't the locust swarm? Well, it's cicadas, right? There, so we're about to have. Speaking of cicadas, we're about to have a huge explosion of cicadas because there's two separate species of them who are lining up to whatever it is release, I guess, onto the world, come out of hibernation or whatever. And the cycles are linked up, I think, for the first time probably in a long time. So, yeah, we're about to have a whole lot of cicadas all over the place. Florida 5e settlement, yeah, that's a thing that that's in the in the very early stages of development, but yeah, so there's a plan for that. Uh, listening, having a rough day today. It's the 50th anniversary of your dad's passing. Sorry to hear that, Ruby. Yeah, that's always tough when th those kind of uh, anniversaries and birthdays and stuff is never fun. I like to let players do random quests to gain extra experience and a chance at new gear. At the end, find a clue to who the BBEG is. Yeah. I mean, and that's a thing, too. You don't always have to necessarily have it fully laid out as to how you want it to happen as much as you just kind of let the players go until you reach sort of a natural place of, okay, we're going to, this is where we're going to plug in the, the main quest line stuff. Doing physical copies of my new album. Uh, I've kind of looked into it. I'm not sure. I might. I don't I I never did any for join the party. So if I if I do go to physical copies for stuff, it'll be more likely that I go back and do a run of Attack of Opportunity and join the party just cuz I think those are much more popular albums and probably therefore more likely to sell. And I don't know about Organized Lightning. I will say, oh we'll talk about that later too, but this album that I'm currently working on with my buddy Song is going to have physical copies, so that's pretty cool. You don't think you could run Sandbox, my players could get lost in a hallway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The, you you, you got to keep them on a bit of a leash in the sense of, you know, like I said, soft railroad. 
easy guidelines to just kind of push them along. I prefer to let my players' characters actually have impact on their world, whether it's big or small. A few times I've DM'd the players seem to want more structure or just a shortcut to combat. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that that's tough to deal with, Ruby. I hope that you I hope that you feel better. Get yourself some cookies or something. <laughs> Do one of those. Uh, go go treat yourself with something. Get some Dunkaroos or something. All right. Well, I think that there's an answer for that, and somewhere somewhere in there, there's an answer. This next question, I'm actually excited to talk about because it's about. Um, it's actually from Mike, who's here, so that's good. It's about his campaign. But thank you for the question, Esty. I, I would I would say that it's it's a combination of both. If pressed, I would probably prefer a more open world, just because I think that, you know, if it was the a party of the friends, we could kind of figure it out. But I do think overall you're gonna need some sort of a North Star, so to speak, as for plot purposes, to to give you motivation. And maybe it's a thing that you can write with uh, with and among your characters and, and other party members' backstories. Players are not really engaged enough to do full sweat sandbox. We switched to a combat arena format, and they're having a grand time. Yeah. Oh, man, some of my fondest memories are, are nights where we just did, like, combat one-shots, where it was just, like, build a monster, <laughs> build an epic character, and then we're going to put them in, like, a coliseum-type arena and just fight. That's some of the most fun stuff. So, thank you for the question, SD. As I said, the next question's from Mike, so let's get into that one. I'd be interested to see what chat has to say about this, too, because I came up with what I thought were a couple of cool ideas. Mike asks, Oh, great maestro of melodies, marauder of mundanity, and master of madness. Well, high praise from Mike. I need to replace the holy, lame, and sucky ending to my time base campaign. It's an all-dwarven group consisting of a fighter, monk, druid, and warlock. They are forced to bounce through time to stop the collapse of a great dwarven mountain in which they are also trapped. Yikes. Along the way, there are cultists, crazy kings, art thieves, way too many blink dogs, living fates, a sentient and persnickety time travel device, and stone giants. What I need from the sage is a spicy, time-themed ending. I see what you did there. Different from a typical old boss fight. Do you have a suggestion or two? Thank you for the question, Mike. First of all, don't be so hard on yourself. The, you're, you, it, it's, you're, you're probably fine. It's probably better than you think it is. Remember, we talked about that before. It's better than you think it is. Like, especially with stuff like DMing and writing. This is just a quick note before we get into the, like, the campaign stuff. But, like, you know the story. So you think it sucks, <laughs> but they don't know the story yet. So it's, you know, you got to write that tightrope because it's like, well, you know, you think it's stupid because you understand it fully. Whereas if it's presented to them in such a way where like pieces are revealed, then it's a totally different thing. They have a different perspective. But I made some notes, so I will talk about notes while chat puts in their own ideas. Uh... Chrono Mage? Evil Chrono Mage? Who manipulates time? Maybe instead of like a regular boss fight, you send your players back to different times. Maybe this guy sends them back to different times. Or gal, this evil Chrono Mage. And for, they're forced to compete in challenges that are based on different like types of time manipulation. So like... You know, either you maybe you separate them and send them off separately, or maybe the party just kind of jumps into these different little mini challenges where it's stuff like, okay, everything in this is fast forwarded, and well, like whatever that means for you mechanically, or in slow motion, or in rewind. That'd be really interesting. Alternatively, you can always have the players fight younger slash older different versions of themselves and each other. Like, they have to fight a mirror image of their party, but, like, it's from the future. Or, like, a different timeline entirely, which would probably be cooler because they could be different versions of the existing characters. Possibly with, like, slightly different paths or choices. Right? So, like, if your fighter, just as, as an example, like, if your fighter is, like, 
a battle champion. Is that what it's called? If if your uh, if your fighter is like a battle champion fighter versus a fighter that's like an eldritch knight, you know what I mean? So they kind of have to, and they kind of did that. To, well, spoiler alert, but what whatever the game has been out for like almost a, like six months, but they kind of do that towards the end with the finale of Baldur's Gate 3, but they do it in kind of a more lazy way where they're like golems. Like, this would be more of like they're actually different versions of the characters themselves with fleshed out kind of stories and maybe just like different... They're just different versions of the characters. My wife and I recently watched this thing about the multiverse and it's just, it's really freaked me out. In particular, this guy said this thing where he was like... Yeah, well, when you think about it, when you consider the multiverse theory where there are, like, infinite versions of ourselves, you know, those moments where there were things that you did or didn't do, it's possible that the other version of you also did or didn't do, do it the other way. <laughs> and it's like, I don't need that, man. <laughs> I got enough going on in my head without that. But, yeah, multiverse stuff. So there's some options. Let's see what Chad is saying. Just steal the Time Bandits plot move, maybe. A time-based ending wouldn't be a boss fight. Usually you've prevented the disaster from ever occurring, or you've split off into a new side reality, a few other possibilities. Make the ending them finding out they're actually causing the collapse, and they have to go back to convince themselves to stop them from starting the adventure. That's actually a really cool idea. They, um... Like, the further in time they go, the the more that it's going to collapse. So they've got to rewind time and go back and find whatever the time point was where that happened. It was just a bad dream. <laughs> they could actually fight themselves, roll against themselves. That's true. You could make them fight each other, too. Let's see. What is... Not late here now. That's right. Hello, Mother. Yeah, you're not here if you're you're what you're wait. You're not late if you're here. You're not here if you're late. Well, I guess that kind of works both ways. Is that one of those before and after things like on Jeopardy? Good to see you. The goatee timeline. What? <laughs> oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the evil versions of themselves. So, yeah. I think any of those things. The one might make for an interesting one shot. I don't remember the plot for it. Each turn for the BBEG roll to see what time period the big battle is. That turn. Oh, I like that, too. That's actually a really cool point from Avram that I missed earlier, but see now. Yeah, that's a cool thing. If If you were able to figure out a way to change the time during the fight itself so that they were... Oh, man, that expands it even further on different versions of themselves because it's like, what if they had to go through a thing where it's like they have to go back and destroy their level one selves and then their level five selves, etc., all the way up until, like, current, where they then fight dark, evil versions of their current ones. So. All right. Well, yeah, I think that there's some really cool stuff in there. Yeah, Chrono Mage for sure put that in there. And I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure the campaign is fine. But yeah, like if you've got a monk that's like a Way of the Elements monk, then you do one that's like Way of the Fist or whatever. If they if 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 that if they're a moon circle druid, well, golly, then it's a circle of spore druid that they have to fight. Could also have the time traveling send them to a totally different place or dimension, and maybe they get to solve a mystery over there in that different place to prevent the mountain disaster. I mean, it is cool that they're just kind of like in a mountain that's about to collapse, but I like the idea of giving them the only real, the only real way forward is back. Whoa, what is that, like a log line for a time travel movie? But you know what I mean? So if the goal is to prevent this from happening, then they're going to have to somehow go back in time to fix some things or change some things. If they destroy their level one selves, would they die in the future? That's Well, depends on how it works. Maybe it's them from a different timeline. The time police are trying to stop the BBEG from killing the last one. 
uh, the killing the last other one of himself. But yeah, didn't they do like a Rick and Morty about that episode? <laughs> didn't they do a Rick and Morty episode about that where like Rick has to go kill all the different versions of himself? Yeah. Some Doctor Who flavor. Yeah, man. Ooh. Well, thank you for the question, Mike. Much appreciated. That was a good one. And that was a fun exercise. I think you could come up with some really cool stuff. Feel free to use any of that. All righty. So that was Mike's question. We're going to move on. The next question this evening is from Parrot. <laughs> and sorry, I don't mean to like laugh at your name. It just like caught me off guard. Uh, let's see. Parrot asks, probably just like a handle, right? Probably not. Your mama probably didn't name you Parrot, but that's okay. All right. So Parrot asks, Hey, yes. Yesterday you made a TikTok video where you talked about the possibility of newer shows already using AI generated scripts. As a writer, are you concerned about the future of available jobs or projects because of this? Also, are you working on any new music? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Parrot. Let's get into that. First of all, just to clarify for people, that wasn't uh, yesterday. I got this email a few days ago, so I actually made that video a couple of days ago. But first of all, I'll speak about like what I said in the video, and then maybe I'll expound upon it a little bit. So there's actually two things. One quick thing that I'll just say to run through. I don't know if anyone else has noticed, and I might have talked about it on here before about this uptick in like rich people sympathy content. These shows like. Triangle of Sadness and The White Lotus and uh, Succession and The Crown to an extent. But these shows where it's like, look, it, it uh, man, it, it's being rich ain't all it's crack, cracked up to be. It, 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 maybe be careful what you wish for. And it's like, what? am I supposed to feel bad for these people with all this money? The Fall of the House of Usher, there's another one. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me, and I'm of the opinion <clears throat> that AI is very, very close to replacing most labor. By very close, I mean like within the decade, maybe even sooner for a lot of certain things. But that's to say, like, I feel like rich people have always just kind of like allowed normal people or regular people to just exist because it's like, well, we need their labor, you know? When we convince them of, the, of you know, this dream for them to go and, like, have this house and, <laughs> and mortgage and, and all these things. And then they'll just work, and that'll be great. We don't have to worry about them complacency. But now that there's AI to do that work, I think they might just let us die. But that's kind of a separate situation from what you initially asked. I just thought of it and wanted to mention it to anybody who else maybe who maybe else has seen that trend. And the other thing, which is what you did ask about, which I spoke about in that TikTok, was... <coughs> oh, man, sorry. I can't seem to, like, clear my throat. You asked about AI-generated scripts. Yeah, so let's see. The first time that I really noticed this kind of thing is with a couple of let's see a couple of a couple of years ago there was a show on Netflix called Clickbait and like it just felt very weird like disjointed like it, it's you know there were moments of brilliance but then also moments of like what is this is this it, it felt like some weird like middle school film project and I've noticed that in some newer shows that I've been watching in The Tourist, as well as in The Gentleman, the new Guy Ritchie series, where I don't know if it's like, and I mean, I'm talking about within the episode, right? I'm not talking about like this episode was great and then that one was weird. I'm talking about like scene by scene. There's something, I'll see a scene and I'll be like, whoa, man, that's like one of the coolest things I've seen this year. And then we'll go into the next scene and it's like, what is this? How is this? And you might think, well, you know, if there's a team of writers, but that's not what it feels like to me. What it feels like to me is they're already using, maybe not necessarily ChatGPT, but certainly AI software to generate the bones of these scripts. 
And then the writers that they have on staff are essentially just going through and like sprucing it up and rewriting it in places. Because when you think about it, most writers, especially ones that are like retained for a company, because like I'd imagine most writers in Hollywood are like contracted, but writers that like if they work for a studio or or a production house, their job is mostly rewriting anyway. Like most of those studio houses are already sitting on thousands of scripts. So there are people whose job it is to just like go through and read those scripts and find them and be like, oh, hey, this is a cool script. A matter of fact, I think that's how Forrest Gump got made. I think that movie was written like, you know, several years before it was made and somebody just like came across the script and was like, whoa, this is really good. But that's to say like their job is rewriting already. So if to the point of like eliminating labor, if the AI can just give you 40 pages and then you have your writing staff do what they're doing anyway, which is going through those 40 pages, finding out what needs to get clipped or added or changed in terms of like just the general plot and dialogue. And I also wonder if in doing that they're doing they're using like some sort of an algorithm as to like which spots to change so that it's not so noticeable you know the th the th the three body problem show feels that way too it's like what's going on here is this is this all just is this the computer making this stuff up and then us editing it slightly i think that that'll become the norm you asked if i was concerned about the future availability of jobs or projects not really for me specifically because i already work for myself so i already kind of don't depend on like a production house i guess like youtube to an extent right but honestly like most of my money these days comes from other avenues so i think that i'm gonna be fine i think that they're the hardest okay so this is what i'll say I think that the craft, like for the craft of writing or just like content creation in general, there will be a temporary hit, the hardest of which we haven't seen yet. Because we're still like, there's still this level of uncanny valley. There's still this gap of like, well, you can tell. Like even with the imagery, right? Like there's still something's a bit off. But I don't think that'll be there in, in two years or less. I just don't think it will be. Because if the technology builds upon itself and they're just making it better and better, I mean, the kind of stuff that they're doing with video now, I remember like a year or two ago where they had like the original like AI video that came out where people were like eating lava and stuff and all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was so very clearly AI. And the video today, you still can tell to an extent, but that's going to go away. And so... I think that there always will be an audience for analog or human art or whatever they decide to call it, like post AI conquering it all. And in fact, I think that with the uptick of the AI, the craving of that kind of stuff is going to increase. Like the younger generation already craves that. And I also said, like, oddly enough, this technology came along a little too late for the powers that be to abuse it to its full capacity. Because, like, can you imagine if we were able to just, like, generate AI imagery or AI video in, like, the 60s? That would be, I mean, that's a lot. That's an incredible amount of power. And um, one last thing I'll say about the AI stuff is that there is a new altered content tab on YouTube uploads. So that's a thing that I picked up on. It's a little bit of a CYA on their part, right? Because, again, what's going to happen is in two years, we won't be able to tell the difference. And somebody's going to make a video of a really prominent figure saying something. And a lot of people are going to watch it and believe it. And it may or may not motivate them to take physical action or commit crimes, in which case YouTube doesn't want their hand you know google's like well we're wiping our hands of that because if that ever happens and it comes out that it's like well you know this person did this because they were following this video and then you know prosecution's going to go to google and be like well, what's going on and google's going to be like hey listen there was there's a thing there's a button that they got to click on the thing when they upload and tell us so it's not our responsibility it's not our problem if somebody believed it well you know 
I've been kind of rambling too. I need to look at some of the some of the chat. Wasn't there a song in the new Wish movie that they confirmed was written by AI? Probably, dude. The music AI is crazy too. Didn't a production re uh, a production robot somewhere within fifty minutes of working realize what it would be doing for the rest of its life and shut down and fall over? That's true. I think that did happen. You need to watch Three Body Problem. It it's all right. I think AI works well for generating a framework, but it lacks the finesse of humanity. Artisan content. Oh, I like that. That's a good term for it. Been basically working for myself the last couple of years. Not having someone holding a job over my head. It's kind of a threat to me, but it's the greatest takeaway. Yeah, I tell people that all the time. Like, working for yourself is the scariest and the most rewarding thing you'll ever do. It's terrifying because there is value in having a steady paycheck, you know, having insurance through your employer, having W-2 where your, you know, taxes are just set it and forget it. You don't have to worry about it. So that is something I guess that I kind of miss about like a, a quote unquote regular job. I mean, I still, you know, I work a regular job, but I mean, as my primary source of income, but the type of autonomy and satisfaction that you have working for yourself, I think is worth it. So AI is very bad at writing good music, but it's scary that it could even write as well as it already can. Yeah. And the thing is, is that AI is very bad at writing good music now. But it's just like anybody that's like, oh, man, this is awful. Can you believe that they're just going to like make uh, make these soulless pieces just for profit? And it's like they were already doing that. This just makes it faster. Right. So and listen, obviously, stuff like art is subjective, in particular music. Like I'm never somebody to yuck somebody's yum or like judge somebody for something that they like. If you, you know, you like what you like. But I think that there are some people. A lot of creatives or independent artists themselves who tend to agree that like there are there are tons of things that are just made for the sake of profit. They're like pop music in general is pretty much just that. Where it's pretty much any of the like mainstream music that you'll hear on the radio is kind of that way. And it's not to say that it completely lacks soul and the artists that made it lack soul. But it's you're not going to get the same kind of passion that you're going to get from some artist that has like 200 followers and has been making music for 20 years. So, so said I agree with your pessimism. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's not, I, you know, I'm not somebody, I, I am probably more of a pessimist than an optimist, but... It's not about trying to be like scary. I think it's just being realistic with what we're going to see because it's like this is this is consumerism, this is capitalism. This is you know, the the seeking of infinite growth in a finite system. <laughs> so, yeah, it's going to get really weird and most content is probably just going to be AI generated. But I think that the good news and the silver lining to that is is that because of that, there's going to be on the other side of this a large uptick in people craving content that's more real, as it were. So, I think I answered the question. <laughs> I did get kind of ranty on that, but I do feel strongly about that. It's like, is anybody else seeing this? Like, with the scripts, it's just like, hmm, it's very strange. Well, thank you very much for the question, Parrot. That, that um, it was a, a bigger answer than I thought it would be. So thank you. All right. We got uh, two more questions. One of them is like a follow-up slash question. So that'd be cool because it's like kind of both. And then one of them is just a question. So the next one is just the question and it's a question from Chris. And Chris asks, hey, Charles, I hope all is well with you and yours. This week is a good one for me. Glad to hear it. What's your Hogwarts house? Which Ninja Turtle are you? And which golden girl are you? Hope the week treats you well. Thank you very much, Chris. What a cool question. Also, like, kind of an eclectic one, but I'm I'm here for it. All right, let's talk about it. So, I'm a Ravenclaw, so let's get that out of the way. And it's not close. Even as a kid reading the books, I was like, oh, man, I'd be a Ravenclaw. For Ninja Turtles it, and the Golden Girls, it gets a little tougher. Because I think that there's obviously, and it uh, you know it goes to show that how well the characters are written. I think that there's a little bit that I could relate to with each of them. 
I was always a Donatello guy. He was always my favorite. And likely I probably would if you just found me in a group of guys would probably be like the Donatello nerdy one. I think maybe when I was younger, I was more of a Michelangelo, just kind of like a party animal. But definitely like, you know, the last year or two of high school into my 20s, I I think I became like a little more reserved and like more of just like leaning into the nerdy stuff. So probably Donatello. But, you know, there are also days where I feel like Raphael. So I have lots of like an attitude. So and so Ravenclaw, Donatello and it's probably Dorothy. But I also feel like a lot of my friends and family would say Rose. <laughs> so it's kind of between those two. Ron says, I want to be Dorothy, but I'm Rose. Yeah, I th- I think that's actually what it is. That's exactly it. Is that it's like, in my head, I'm Dorothy. But I think for most people that know me, I'm Rose. <laughs> so, I wish I was Blanche. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, I feel like I I might have, as in, in my teenage years, I was probably more of a Blanche. Just like a, let's party, let's go. Uh, Raven, Raffer, Donatello, and Sophia. Did anyone else just have the video scramble? Oh, no. I hope there's not an issue. Gryffindor, Michelangelo, Sophia. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I can totally see all of that, too, by the way, Song. Yeah, so I'm a Ravenclaw, Donatello, Rose. Hey, and that's what Purple Myrrh is. Cool. Didn't see a scramble. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the, uh, man, Golden Girls, what a great show. I haven't watched that in a long time. But yeah, those were fun questions. Definitely Ravenclaw, Donatello, Rose. Also, like, Rose is just sweet. Like, I don't know, I guess I'm kind of a nice guy. I think that that's why I feel, like, people feel like appro- like I'm approachable. Or people just, like, trauma dump on me because it's, like, I'm nice. I'm not going to judge you or, like, say something mean. Mostly. <laughs> Unless I'm in like a Raphael mood. But. All right. Well, that answers that. We've got one more question that's also a follow up. And then we'll do a little chat chat and just kind of hang. So, how about that? So, thanks for the question, Chris. The last question slash follow up of the evening is from Carl, who also has confirmed with me that the pronunciation of his name is Swedish, and I think we've had this discussion like a year ago, but now I've, it's it's been put in the email. So it's Kale or Kali is how it's pronounced, but also Carl. So we're going to go with Carl because I could definitely say that. So let's let's get into that. So Carl asks, hello, Chaz, a quick follow up to episode 66. A show I think would be a great D&D adventure is Alice in Borderlands. What do you think? Yeah, I think that would be super cool. I'm totally for that. Sounds great. Since you always want to monetize and grow, what do you think of the idea of paid DM from one in the man short sphere and letting fans join if they pay? Not pay to win or anything, but you're but you offer the service since DMs are normally in short demand. Cheers. Wow, sorry for like <laughs> all the typos on that question, but I, I think I know what you're asking, so we'll talk about that. Alice in Borderlands, I'm not all that familiar with. It sounds familiar, and it makes me feel like I've watched some of it, but not all of it. It's like a sci-fi show, right? Or, or... Are you being direct in in combining the properties of Alice in Wonderland and the Borderlands games? Because that's a cool concept, too. Between you and Ben Monat of Oddity Archive, I'm getting back into music. Well, you should. Music's great. Music's a staple. Love the Alice in Borderland show. I feel like I saw, like, a couple of episodes, but then I never followed up on the rest of it, so... So I'll, I I do think like Alice in Wonderland conceptually is really really cool and I that's a story I think that needs like more of like a modern retelling. It's a Korean fantasy show. 
It's a two season series on Netflix. Maybe I'll check it out. I, I probably should. I feel like it's a thing that I watched like when it came out. I watched an episode or two and then just like never, never finished it. As for the DM stuff, my problem is time. So I'm finding that out just in general because I do so much stuff all the time that I have very little time that's left. The downtime that I do have is kind of already full with stuff like playing Baldur's Gate 3 and, you know, working on this book that I've been rewriting. Is it Japanese? The players play life or death games based on playing cards. Yeah, that could be a really cool spin on it if you included, like, the deck of many things with that. Alice in AI land. That'd be really interesting. Yeah, and by the way, on that, that's that's a, an uptick. I think we'll see an uptick in that kind of content is, like, content that's about AI. Like, scary, world-ending, apocalypse-type AI stuff will probably get really popular over the next several years. The Evil Drow, Red Queen, BBEG, Warlock with a Pack with Loth. If you want a good book series that reimagines Alice in Wonderland, check out The Looking Glass Wars by Frank Better. Oh, so good, huh? Well, we'll have to look into that. And honestly, I probably should start reading more if I'm going to be writing, just because it can give me some help on that. Best friend DMs for money. Yeah, I mean, I would. if it, the, the thing with me, too, it's more than just like a time thing. It's also about like... It's tough, the relationship that I've had with D&D over the last several years, because, and I think I talked about this last time, where it's like, it's hard for me to want to or plan to play if there's not any monetization to it. (laughs) And that's not so much on like a greedy tip as much as it's on like a trying to maximize the audience that that I've been so blessed with, right? Like... So it's more than just about like, oh, how can I make money? Because it's like I could do that with anything. If I wanted to like scheme and make money, I could just, you know, do whatever. But when it comes to the D&D stuff, it's like, yeah, of course I want to play. But then also it's like, can we monetize this? Because we have an audience, so it feels foolish. And it feels like to me, it feels silly to not give that to the audience. Does that make sense? So it's like if I'm going to be doing it, I would rather film it and have it produced. I actually got re- asked recently on TikTok if I wanted to play a and d campaign this summer. And I said I'd be down for it. I don't know if it's going to be monetized or not. And hopefully there's not, you know, hopefully it doesn't clash with any of my other stuff. Maybe by then I can kind of adjust my schedule a bit to make room for it. But I would like to play because it's been a while. But it's just like... Campaign set in the show Once Upon a Time would be really cool to play. Everyone makes their own character based on a fairy tale character. Funny you mention that, Amanda. Because, well, you'll see. You'll see on this week's episode and next week's episode. So, do you have a more fun while filming it? Do you play to the camera more? Probably. My thing is, is like I'm, I'm kind of always on. You know what I mean? Like, whether I'm on or not. I'm not too much different. I mean, obviously in the in the sketches, right? Like they're scripted. So there's a you know, there's a job that we're doing where it's like, okay, here are the lines to say. But certainly on this show, and then just like in general, I think anybody that's close to me would tell you, like, I'm kinda always <laughs> like whether there's a camera on or not, I'm kinda always on. So you're very against charging for DMing. I mean, I understand it in the sense of you know, you are paying someone for their time and especially if it's a th- it, to make it more of like a business transaction versus like friends. Because, there, you know, there are a lot of people that are, are in situations where either they don't have friends that are interested in playing or, you know, they live in a particular place where there's not really a gaming store. And so it's more difficult for them to play. So for that, I understand but that's actually another component of it, too. And I got sidetracked talking about other stuff, I'm talking about filming and stuff. But there, there's there's that component of it where it's like, uh, yeah, well, am I going to do it? And like, am I going to monetize it like for the audience that I have? And then there's also like a little bit of guilt there, too, because it's like while I do think people should be compensated for their time, I also would feel kind of bad 
if I were, you know, if I if I were playing with people who probably would just like enjoy being part of the campaign and it's like a pay for thing. I don't know. It's kind of like the cameo thing. Like I never really had interest in doing that because it's like I'm the type of I'm the type of person where like you could probably just email me. Like if you want to talk to me or you want me to like say something, just send me an email. I'm usually pretty good about responding depending on what it is. So I always thought that that was kind of like kind of sketchy, kind of kind of kind of flim flammy of just like, oh yeah, pay me to to say a thing. It's like, okay. I guess that I get it for like super celebrities, but still. And yes, we are officially in chat chat. It's it's we just kind of like moved into it. We'd rather see you playing again. Yeah, I would really like to play. It's where favoritism begins, where someone else wants to pay you on the side for better gear. Yeah, and that's that's a thing too. Is that the <laughs> the that's another thing that I don't want to deal with, right? Is that it's like, I don't want somebody to find out like, oh, well, hold on. These people are paying you like whatever it is, $20 an hour to DM their game. Well, I'll give you 50. And it's like, I, it's, it's, I'm not a DM for hire in the strictest sense, right? It's not to say that I'm like totally against the idea, but it's just like, if I were doing it, it's probably more likely that I wouldn't charge people but I would probably want to film it and monetize it. <laughs> Paid DM here. I DM every Friday with like six or seven players, and I charge them $20 for like five to six hours of game time. Free is always nice, but it's my time, and time is money. And honestly, man, like $20 for like a five to six hour session is really affordable, especially if you have it set up where like everybody in the party's chipping in. That's like, what, four bucks a game? I think that's pretty fair. So my question for chat chat is geared for the Discord. Oh yeah, should we add a pay it forward section for people to be able to gift dice sets to others? Oh, that's a good idea. I have no idea how that would work, but I am I think it's great. I'm not opposed to it if you have an idea for something like that or somebody else does. We were just informed by a friend that you're Donatello and you're like Betty White's character from Golden Girls. Yeah, that's that's Rose. I've not read Harry Potter, only seen the movies. Well, from what from what I understand, the Gryffindors are the brave ones. The the Slytherins are the cunning ones. The Hufflepuffs are the foodies <laughs> who are loyal. And then the Ravenclaws are the the smarty pants. We're the wise ones. Cuz even $20 for 6 hours of entertainment is pretty good. To, yeah, no doubt, dude. I mean, jeez. $20 wouldn't get you tickets to the movie house. And that's like what? Even if you see Oppenheimer, that's half that time. So I think that's really great. Get your mom to do a show where we can ask her about you? Oh, man. I don't know if she'd be up for that. Maybe. At a minimum, maybe we can get her in here as just like a... Well, I mean, she's usually in here. You can ask her questions about me if you want to ask her questions about me. I don't want to make her feel like she's pressured to come on to the show. If anything, if I do any kind of guests or something, it's going to be Justin or Melissa or... Wayland. <laughs> Mom said hell no. <laughs> That's fine. We can figure it out. We'll figure something out. $20 for a few hours of a unique experience doing something you enjoy. I'd say it's worth it per person even. Oh, per person. Even still, again, that's like four bucks an hour. Three bucks, less than four bucks an hour. I think it's totally worth it. And again, like as I mentioned, it's not just a thing where it's like, not everybody has the luxury. You know, I recognize that I'm very fortunate in my life experience of like TTRPGs and D&D &D in particular, having a group of buddies that I've been friends with for a really long time. I'm fortunate that a lot of my close friends I've been friends with since childhood. So um, it's a bit anomalous in that sense, because for me, when I think of D&D, &D, it's just like, oh, well, you know, we just get the gang together and get Ethan or like our buddy Posey's a forever DM and just set something up. But for others, it's not so easy. So something like the idea of like paying a DM, I mean, I don't think that's any different than you paying for a game to play, like a video game. Rich in any rich in many ways, just not the financial department. I hear that, dude. <laughs> 
Let's oh, good thing for the week. Yeah, let's do that. Thank you, Amanda. Good thing for the week. Monday was you and your husband's second anniversary. Eight years together, two years married, and today is your parents' anniversary. Forty nine years. Wow, congratulations. That's awesome. What else? You got other people other people got good stuff for the week? My wife and I this this July will be my wife and I's five year anniversary. But we've married, but we've been together for eleven years in August, I think. You have a great picture with a little bard with a stuffed ninja turtle. And it's Michelangelo, by the way. That's true. Well, maybe we'll show that on the show. I was a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> and I, Mom says that I spoke from the moment my eyes opened. I talked from the moment my eyes opened to the moment I went to bed. Uh, good thing... Uh, good thing of the week. A few weeks ago, I got a raise. This week, your wife did. Whoa. Well, there you go, James. Great. Congratulations. Good thing for the week is this archaeologist found something. And if you go to the Discord, you can see what I found. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to say what it is. That'll that that'll encourage people to go join the Discord and check it out. It's pretty crazy. Pirates are pirates are local archaeologists. And our, our friendly neighborhood archaeologists. <laughs> and uh, he found some interesting stuff. So even if I don't like it, I'll admit there's definitely a market for it. Like you said, not everyone has friends to hit up for DMing or a good store nearby. Yeah, for sure. Plus, you know, some people maybe want to treat it like a different thing where it's just like not like like a video game where it's just like, oh, no, I'm just going to go pay a guy to, you know, play the thing. And then there is value, I think, in playing with people that you don't really like know. You know, there's there's you don't have to worry about stuff like favoritism or like. I don't know. It's just there's probably some value to playing with people that you don't like necessarily know in the actual role play. In my sleep, too. Yeah, always talk. So, yeah, happy anniversary. 17 years married. Nice. What else is going on? Wife is home from work, travel. My good thing of the week was that I got to have a great lunch with my grandmother today. That was really, really nice. My mom's mom. We went and had lunch at Chili's today and we're there for like two and a half hours just mostly talking oh boy you think I talk where do you think I get it from you should meet me meet my grandma she's yeah it's about the same really so it's probably why we were there for two and a half hours Lady Gamecocks won yeah I did see that in CAA oh man and we're close to the NBA end of the NBA season too I'm excited about that spending a lot of time outdoors love the nice weather it's about to get hot. It's about to get way hot here. It's already starting. The downside is as much as I like being a DM, it gets boring. The hobby I like just turned into a job. I like the job, but still I get tired. Listen, I cannot relate to that sentence more. It's, it's how I feel about like content in general. It's tough because, you know, when you're not doing it for money, you're just doing it because you love it. And then when you start to make money from it, you, you, it's great because it's like, whoa, I love it and I'm getting paid for it. But it gets tough because there are elements of, and it, and by the way, this is not just like with the stuff that I do. I think that this is true of like anything, in particular, if you're someone who works for yourself, there are elements of whatever it is that are not enjoyable. And so over time, it can definitely feel like it's a job and it can get boring, but I will say something that helps me is remembering you know, the audience and the people that are there. Sometimes there are times where I don't know if I'm up for doing the pod, but I've been relatively consistent, I think, for the last several episodes. I don't remember the last time. I think I missed one maybe earlier at the beginning of the year because I had like ear problems. But other than that, pretty consistent. Oh, is anyone going to watch the eclipse? Yeah, the eclipse is happening. Oh, man, or Nibiru, depending on who you ask, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's the eclipse happening next week. And then I think it's like right after that, that the cicadas are supposed to just like burst onto the scene. So that'll be, it'll be an interesting week next week. Aren't there, pl is anybody in here, by the way, in the path of totality? Aren't, aren't cities like closing the roads down and stuff? They don't want to deal with, with whatever the issues that are going to come along with that. At work, I worry on a call handle time. But this week, being chatty paid off. One of my customers left me a glowing review on the BBB website. Nice. Good for you. That's always good. 
Let's see. What if the cicadas burst out during the eclipse? Yo, that would be insane. You know what's so funny, too, about the cicada thing is, like, I feel like I, 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 don't, I can't speak to other parts of the country. I guess, I don't know. Are they everywhere? As somebody who grew up listening to them in Florida, that's a thing where, like, if it was, like, a, a, like a global destruction event, Florida would probably, like, no last because we would just, you know, in the 99% range. Yo, that's crazy. Eclipse and locust swarms. Yeah, man, maybe. I think Houston's super close. Yeah, a lot of the places in Texas, I think, are going to be, like, right there. Might head down to your brother's place to catch it. St. Thomas versus London. Made a quick $600 selling the glasses. Whoa. That's a move. Our zoo is asking for volunteers to monitor the animals during the eclipse. Yo, yeah, that's a real freak out. I never even thought about stuff like that. Or stuff like hospitals. But the zoo, dude? Whoa. Yeah. You don't want to... <laughs> you don't want there to be a problem. They're definitely here there in Texas. Too. Okay, yeah. It's going to be crazy. It might be a thing where we don't even really notice it. But then again, it might feel like apocalyptic. If you don't have glasses, but you have a welding mask, you have glasses. <laughs> Thanks, Song. So, oh, yeah, see? Pirate's already on top of it. He's going to use his auto-darkening welding helmet to be the Eclipse. <laughs> All right. Wow. Okay. Well, we're already here at the end. Jeez, I can't believe it. Chat Chat goes by the fastest, I think. Once we start just, like, chilling and talking, that's when the time really starts moving. Thank you so much, Chris, for the gifted memberships. Uh, as a reminder to anybody, if you're considering getting a membership, you get cool little icons that you can use. I believe it also gives you, like, ad-free stuff, so that's cool. Uh, we're here at the end, and I've got editing to do because we're going to be – I'm going to be playing Baldur's Gate 3 tomorrow night, so I'm going to need to get that stuff done while I can. Yes, thank you for the reminder, Mother. But please, everybody, hit the like button, like, comment, subscribe, turn on notifications, rate the podcast on your respective platforms. Join the Discord. There's a link in the chat. Before we get out of here, let's just remind everybody once more of the email. It's bardadvice at gmail.com. It also looks like bardadvice. If you want to get some merch, you can do so over at manshorts.com, or you can also, more importantly, go over to krakendice.com and get yourself a set of the newest dice set. If you want to contribute to anything that I'm doing musically, you can do so directly via PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo, all of which are Yazik, Y-A-H-Z-I-C-K. Thank you all for joining. This has been a fun episode. It's been a great week. I hope that everybody has a great week. The We will be back here next week. Same bar time, same bar channel, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Man Shorts YouTube channel. The audio for this podcast, as always, will be made available tomorrow, Saturday, 12 p.m. noon Eastern Standard Time. I hope that everybody has a fantastic weekend and an even better week, and we will see you next time.